Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you Val for the nice introduction. Michael, thank you for hosting and the other board members for making this all happen. So tonight, I think we titled this, Val and I kind of came up with this on the fly, what do copyrights, trolls, sex, lawyers, raging bull, and self-publishing have in common? But let's start with part one, which is the porn tr trolls cases. Anybody know uh, who wasn't here a couple of years ago, what I'm talking about is uh, a new cottage industry has popped up in the United States about, started about four or five years ago, where producers of adult triple uh, X rated uh, films would um, um, look, hire a private investigator to look on the internet and see who was uploading and downloading their films without permission using BitTorrent, which is, everybody familiar with BitTorrent? It's kind of a, right, all right, modern day version of Napster, better version of Napster, faster, quicker, allows you, okay. And so the, the producers of the films would look on the hire a private investigator, look on the internet, see who was uploading and downloading, get their IP addresses, their internet protocol address, and then file a lawsuit in federal court paying one $350 filing fee and naming anywhere between two to five to a hundred to five thousand five hundred to five thousand John Doe defendants identified only by their I internet protocol address would file the lawsuit in federal court paying one fee for $350 then go to court immediately seek a early discovery order allowing the plaintiff to then subpoena the internet service providers to get the true names and addresses of the subscribers and then without doing anything further send a letter to the subscriber saying you've been observed committing copyright infringement while watching porn. We filed a federal court lawsuit. We're about to name you by your true name as a defendant in this lawsuit. If you'd like to avoid that, visit our website. We take Visa and MasterCard and we'll settle with you today for $3,500. And they were making millions, millions by paying one $350 filing fee. So we talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, was that just very smart, very aggressive, proactive lawyering, using the legal system to the fullest extent of the law, were they just actively, were these lawyers just actively um, representing their clients and doing what lawyers are supposed to do, which is to uh, break new ground, push the boundaries of the law because technology requires us to keep moving ahead and we've, the law has to keep up, or was this an extortion scheme? It really depends on which side of the fence you're sitting on, right? Well, um, what's happened now, so this is, uh, I just wanted to do a little brief update on this. This was going on for years and years and years and millions and millions of dollars were being made by lawyers and then one lawyer in particular, they're, they're actually a group of defense lawyers around the country uh, who have banded together loosely on a listserv to defend the targets of these lawsuits and the targets of these threats because it really feels, at least to this group of lawyers, as an extortion scheme. It's not just proactive lawyering. Um, and one lawyer in particular, a nice lawyer, uh, a nice guy, I know him out of Orange County, Morgan Peets, P-I-E-T-Z. If you look him up on the internet, you'll find him. Morgan has made this his life's work. And uh, he brought a series of motions against one of the plaintiffs and actually more directly against the plaintiff's lawyers in one of these cases that was pending in federal court in LA. And he brought a motion for um, sanctions against not only the plaintiff but the lawyers themselves for really concocting the scheme because it turns out that the lawyers owned the plaintiff production company and were representing themselves and failed to disclose that to the court which is required by federal law. So Morgan and his co-counsel Nick Rinaldo from Northern California brought this motion and um, before Judge Wright, it ended up before Judge Wright in federal court in LA. I, ha I went up to LA last year, I attended the hearing. 
and um, the judge issued an order issuing sanctions. I recommend, if, does everybody have access to PACER or Westlaw, something like that? This order, or if you want, send me an email and I'll, I'll PDF it and I'll be happy to, it's really important, it's really worth reading. Uh, because it's a learning lesson for us as lawyers about what is our role when our client asks us to do a job? Do we have any duty to investigate really the underlying claim? Do we have any duty if we know that the lawyer is really the plaintiff and is failing to disclose that to the court and has instructed us, should we go ahead as lawyers? Hey, I'm, ma I'm making a lot of money, so what the hell? I'm being paid to do a job, I'm gonna do my job. Or do we have a higher duty? Um, this order addresses that issue on multiple levels. Um, so it was in the context of should sanctions be issued against the plaintiff's lawyers for a series of nefarious activities participating in this scheme. I'm just going to read part of it. Case number 2 colon 12-CV8333 in the United States District Court, Central District of California. This is the judge's order. Uh, in 35 years of practicing law, I've never seen an order like this. Stacy, I'll be interested to hear what you think. It starts out like this, quote, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, end quote. Spock, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, 1982. <laughs> you know you're in for a good time when your judge starts quoting Spock. Uh, here's the introduction. Plaintiffs have outmaneuvered the legal system. They've discovered the nexus of antiquated copyright laws, paralyzing social stigma, and unaffordable defense costs and they exploit this anomaly by accusing individuals of illegally downloading a single pornographic video. Then they offer to settle for a sum calculated to be just below the cost of defense. For these individuals, resistance is futile. Most reluctantly pay rather than have their names associated with illegally downloading porn. So now, copyright laws originally designed to compensate starving artists allow starving attorneys in this electronic media era to plunder the citizenry. Plaintiffs do have a right to assert their intellectual property rights, so long as they do it right. But plaintiffs filing of cases using the same boilerplate complaint against dozens of defendants raised the court's alert. It was then when the court realized plaintiffs engaged their cloak of shell companies and fraud that the court went to battle stations. This is a 11-page opinion. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Basically, the judge goes through it and finds that the lawyers were really participating in a fraud upon the court. And then gets to sanctions. Um, let's see. First, an award of attorney's fees to defendants is appropriate. This award compensates them for expenses incurred in this vexatious lawsuit. Therefore, the court awards attorney's fees and costs in the sum of $40,659, and as a punitive measure, the court doubles the award, yielding $81,319. This punitive multiplier is justified by plaintiff's brazen misconduct and relentless fraud. The principals and all the attorneys are jointly liable for this sum and shall pay this sum within 14 days. Second, there is little doubt that lawyers so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so so -and -so suffer from a form of moral turpitude unbecoming an officer of the court. To this end, the court will refer them to their respective state and federal bars. Not a good day if you're, getting, if you're the lawyer getting this order. It gets worse. Third, although plaintiffs boldly probe the outskirts of law, the only enterprise they resemble is RICO. The federal agency 11 decks up, is familiar with their prime directive and will gladly retrofit them for their next voyage. <laughs> the U.S. Attorney's Office. The court will refer this matter to the U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California. The court will also refer this matter to the Criminal Investigation Division of the Internal Revenue Service, because the lawyers were parking all the money in their, in their client trust account and weren't paying taxes, and notify all judges before whom these attorneys have pending cases. For the same reason, uh, stated above, the court will defer lawyer one and lawyer two to the standing committee on discipline for this district. 
This is a lawyer's worst nightmare. And have basically, the update is, as a result of this, that law firm is basically out of business and now they're primarily defending themselves on appeal, trying to overcome the various orders issued by the judge um, and the monetary sanctions and all the other sanctions. And I don't know yet where the state bar is or the U.S. attorney, but this is a bad day if you're the lawyer. And it's all about greed. It's all about greed. Um, and what personally offended me the most was the lawyer in California who was of counsel to the the primary plaintiff's law firm based in Illinois, the lawyer in California, his defense was, I just did what they told me to do, which is the Nuremberg defense, which you know, I, is offensive on so many levels it's hard to calculate it. And he's one of the lawyers who's been sanctioned. The part two of this is what's happened is now instead of the mass Doe's cases where the plaintiffs file the lawsuits against 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 5,000 defendants at the same time, there's another law firm that's pursuing the same model going after defendants or targets who allegedly download porn on the internet via uh, BitTorrent, uh, but they're filing them one at a time. So they're going after one defendant at a time, and again, the same model is, do you really, hey Target, do you really want to defend yourself? Wouldn't you like to settle? Oh, yeah. Who wants to be accused of, you know, in open court of downloading porn? My client, by the way, is, was accused of downloading Punk Rock Orgy in the Woods, one of my favorite titles of all time. <laughs> um, so the, the business model has morphed but goes on, and there are now thousands of cases pending all around the country, one at a time. As far as I know, not one of them has gone to trial yet. It'll be interesting to go to trial, if the, any of them go to trial. By the way, side note, one of the interesting defenses that some of the defendants have put up is that uh, in certain jurisdictions, pornography is illegal, therefore the copyright should not be enforced. And they've raised that as an affirmative defense and tried to get file motion to dismiss, and so far the courts have been uh, unresponsive to the uh, illegality defense in copyright. Pretty much if you fill out the form right, pay your $35 and submit your specimen, you get a copyright registration and you're welcome to pursue copyright litigation. All right, so that's sort of the, the copyright trolls and lawyers update. There's a lot more that can be said about that. Like I said, if you go to Morgan Pizza's website, he's got pages and pages and pages of information about this. He's really proactive, and he is a, he's a real hero in my book. He is taking on cases that you know, other lawyers don't want to take on, and he's fighting motions left and right all over the country because the production companies are making so much money they can hire great lawyers, and they are pursuing this to, uh, to ends of the earth. And Morgan is a one-man shop, and he, he, he deserves our, uh, our thanks and our credit as fellow members of the bar. Let's move on to the Raging Bull case. Show of hands, who hasn't seen Raging Bull starring Mar uh, uh, Robert De Niro? Raging Bull is a very well-known, very controversial, might have won an Academy Award, I'm not sure, film, 1980-1981, based on a 1963 screenplay by uh, Jake LaMotta, who was a boxer, heavyweight boxer, or middleweight boxer, I'm not sure, a professional boxer in the 40s and the 50s, and uh, he was a controversial guy, and, um, and uh, he wrote the screenplay with a fellow, I think a friend named Frank Petrella, in 1963, and then there were a couple of subsequent versions, and eventually it got optioned and it got turned into a film. Well, under the old copyright law, the Copyright Act of 1909, which was in effect until January 1 of 1976, under the old copyright law, the term of a copyright was uh, 28 years, and then it could be renewed for an additional 28 years. Then the new Copyright Act, new Copyright Act, now almost 40 years old, 1976 took effect, and the, the length of a copyright changed to what is now life of the author plus 70, was originally life of the author plus 50, now it's life of the author plus 70, plus it's a slightly different term if it's a corporate work. But uh, under the old act, 28 years plus 28, now because of the new Copyright Act, basically old copyrights prior to 1976 are good for 28 years, and then if they're renewed, another 67 years, which gets them up to 95 total. 
<clears throat> but there's a nuance in the copyright law that says that under certain conditions, the, owner, the original author or the heirs of the author can uh, terminate the, copyright the original copyright transfer and get the rights back. It's the second bite of the apple theory. Uh, the theory being that copyright authors of copyrightable works, <coughs> screenplays, books, motion pictures, photographs, etc., often when they're young and, uh, young and starting out, will make bad deals. They'll sell their work for pennies on the dollar, only to have it become a million dollar, multi-million dollar, a billion dollar industry years later, and the authors or their heirs deserve a, deserve a second bite of the apple after the purchaser has made a ton of money or after a number of years and presumably has made a ton of money. So what happened was, to make a long story short, Jake LaMotta dies, the boxer, Petrella dies, and his rights go end up going to his daughter. She then <clears throat> files a copyright in the 1960, a copyright renewal in the 1963 screenplay that the film is based on. And start, starting in about, I think, 1991, let me see here. Yeah, starting in about 1991, she, uh, she renewed it. And then in 1998, she starts writing letters to the film production company saying, guess what? I own the copyright in the screenplay. You can no longer distribute the film without my permission. We need to make a deal, and I'm terminating your rights. They go back and forth for years, letter writing back and forth, and eventually she files a lawsuit. The defendants, the film production company, naturally says, gee whiz, you've known about this for a long time. They file a motion to dismiss basically on the ground of latches. They waited too long and the statute of limitations, because the statute of limitations for copyright infringement is three years. So the film production company wins on, uh, wins in the trial court, wins in the Ninth Circuit. It goes up to the US Supreme Court, lo and behold. And in what I would consider a case of strange bedfellows, last month, the US Supreme Court, in an opinion written by, Justice Ginsburg, I believe. Um, oh yeah, where, where is it? Sorry, give me a second. Justice Ginsburg, right. With Scalia, Thomas, Alito, Sotomayor, and Kagan concurring. <laughs> and Breyer, Roberts, and Kennedy dissenting. You don't see that too often. By the way, the case site if you haven't read it, is I think it's uh, uh, 50, 572 US. I don't have the page number 2014, but it's easy to find. Petrella versus Metro Goldwyn Mayer, case number 12 1315. And the issue is well, in, in light of the fact that there's a three year statute of limitations, um, and there's this doctrine of latches, and she waited some 18 years to file her lawsuit in 2009, um, is she precluded from relief? She just waited too long. And the court said, no, not precluded. Why? Because the statute of limitations for copyright al allows you to go back as long as the allegedly infringing work is still being produced and or distributed, is still in the stream of commerce, the infringement goes on. So she was allowed, when she filed her lawsuit in 2009, to go back to 2006 only to seek damages. Why allow somebody to sit on their hands for 18 or 19 years or 20 years? And the court says, it might be, it might seem unfair, but there's some fairness built into this because of the fact that the plaintiff can only go back for three years. That may mean that the damages that the plaintiff is entitled to are going to be minuscule in comparison to the damages the plaintiff might have been entitled to had the plaintiff filed the lawsuit 15, 16, 18 years ago when the movie was in its first run and making tons of dollars. So there's kind of a built-in, if you will, protection according to the court in, in, in light of the statute of limitations only allowing the plaintiff to go back three years. So there's hope for little Richie. Say again? 
There's hope now for little Richard. There's hope for every artist who's been ripped off and believes that they have some kind of claim, whether it's copyright infringement or breach of contract. Um, well, breach of contract maybe not because the statute of limitations for breach of contract in California is four years for a written contract and two or three for an oral contract. Two? Still two? So really this is only going to, I think, primarily going to help plaintiffs in copyright infringement cases, which gets us to the next case of interest. <laughs>